Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our uh, February stargazing lecture. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'll be your MC for this evening. Um, so just a few announcements before we get started. And then I'll introduce our speaker who will give roughly a 30 minute presentation. And then we'll follow it up with Q&A and a couple minutes of Q&A just specifically for our speaker. And then following that, we'll have a Q&A panel consisting of uh, our speaker, Dr. Spake, myself, and then three other members of the department who work on a variety of different um, topics in the field of astronomy and planetary science. And we'll field questions from the audience on whatever subjects you guys are curious to know. Um, in addition to the, the people present in person, we're live streaming this via a camera here on YouTube Live. Come on in, guys, on YouTube Live and on Facebook Live. So we'll also potentially have questions um, and interaction from our online audience. Hi, hi, everybody. Uh, at home. Um, so this event, the Stargazing Lecture, is one in a series of monthly events that we host here on Friday nights. Our next one is being given by Dr. Niels Deppa, who is a postdoc here, but will this fall he'll be a professor at Cornell University in, in New York. And he's going to talk, we're working out the, the, the exact topic, but he's going to talk something about black holes. He works on gravitational wave and the numerical relativity associated with, with how you predict the observational signature when black holes merge together and how not just is there a, a, a visual signal from what might occur when those, th that merger occurs, but there's a signal that's present in what we refer to as gravitational waves, ripples in space time that we can pick up with instruments like the LIGO instrument that, that occurred a few years ago and was awarded the Nobel Prize. So he'll talk something about, he'll give it, presentation something about black holes. And then we have another series of events called Astronomy on Tap that take place at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena, once a month on a Monday night. Our next one, I need to check the date. The next one, oh no, I don't need to check the date. I know the date. March 13th, Monday, March 13th. So just a two and a half weeks from now. And I forget the presentation topics, but I'll put out a poster about that probably this weekend. So follow our social media or our YouTube page. No, it won't be on YouTube. So just on social media. I'm trying to make these occur live streamed um, on YouTube as well, but but uh, haven't yet been successful on that front. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think those are the bulk of my announcements. We obviously aren't going to be doing any stargazing tonight because of the torrential rain that we're encountering here in Southern California. Uh, we just, unfortunately, optical telescopes like the ones, like the one in the corner that we'll do a, a, a little demo of how it interacts since we can't do a real demo outside, but um, we don't have telescopes that are capable of piercing through the clouds. You can look through clouds if you're using uh, radio telescopes, certain wavelengths of radio waves. Um, you aren't affected by atmospheric conditions, but that's not what we're looking at with our eyes tonight. So, so no observing um, tonight. Okay, I think those are my, my announcements. So um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. Jessica Spake. She uh, started in the UK. She went to Imperial College in London for her undergraduate before doing her PhD at University of Exeter um, and has been a Pegasi 51B fellow here at Caltech for the last few years. And tonight she's going to talk about something I'm very interested in, which is how long atmospheres can remain around exoplanets and if they're, they're there long enough for life to actually develop. So please welcome our speaker, Dr. Jessica Spake. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, thanks also everyone for bearing the torrential downpour that's occurring today. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I don't have enough room on this slide to acknowledge everybody that I work with, uh, but please bear in mind that all the stuff that I'm about to talk to you about today it's all done by huge teams of scientists. We never really do this work alone. There's never really one person that solves all the answers. So thank you to all my colleagues who helped me out with this. Hmm? Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay. 
right? So I'd like to start by relaxing for a minute and giving us time to enjoy the sound of exoplanet discovery. Out there, orbiting around nearly every star in the galaxy are exoplanets. Exo means outside. These are planets outside of our solar system. And we found over 5,000 of these orbiting around other stars. And we're pretty sure that most of the stars you see have at least one or two planets orbiting them. We find them with telescopes like Kepler, which focused on that purple patch of sky you see there. And in this video, the tone of the sound you hear tells you how fast a planet orbits around its host star, and the size of the dot tells you the size of the planet. But for most planets that we've found, that's pretty much all the information that we have. But the size of a planet and the length of its orbit doesn't tell you much about the story of an individual planet. It doesn't tell you what it's made of, and it doesn't tell you whether that planet is habitable or if it ever has been habitable. And for that, we need to know the story of each of these planets. I can't. Hello, people online. So we're trying to piece together the story of exoplanets. And we want to know if there ever has been or if there will be another place where life exists out there. Planets start life in a disk around a young star. And this is a very violent place. In this image of a young star, the star is in the center of this hourglass of gas and dust. And that's what's lighting it all up. But right across the center, you can see a dark band. And this is an edge on view of a protoplanetary disk. And this is where planets are formed. And right now we're trying to understand around which kinds of stars and in which kinds of protoplanetary disks to which kind of planets form. And once they're born, we need to know the rest of the stories, especially because even for older planets, space can be a violent place still, especially for the atmospheres of these planets. And that's because this acts as the interface between the planet and the rest of space. Now, atmospheres are affected by magnetic fields. They can be affected by giant impacts, like the one that formed the moon around the Earth. And they're also impacted by the star. Now the star can emit these very strong winds and very strong radiation. And this can escape the atmosphere into space. And this is what I'm interested in. I wanna know how long can planets hold on to these atmospheres in these pretty tough environments. The earth is a beautiful blue color because of our atmosphere. The atmosphere gives us enough pressure at the Earth's surface to maintain liquid water oceans. If you compare this to the bare rock of the moon at the bottom of this photo, which is airless. Now this moon is the same average distance away from the sun and yet it's completely lifeless. There's no water on the surface. Some people consider this the most influential photo ever taken. First shot of the Earth rise on the surface of the moon taken by the Apollo astronauts in 1969. I struggle to express how moving I find this image. I love the contrast between the earth and the bare rock. Our home looks very inviting, but also very fragile. We don't know if there's anywhere else in the universe that's this beautiful. But since the end of the last millennium, we've made some pretty extraordinary discoveries. So in 1991, the year I was born, we didn't know of the existence of any exoplanets. But now we have over 5,000. I'm really just getting started because we think there really is a planet around every star in the galaxy. So here are some artists' impressions of some of the exoplanets that you might be most interested in. Now these are not real images and I'll explain why in a little bit, but there are around 20 or so planets that are just about the right size to be rocky and they're just about the right distance between 
them and their host stars that if these planets do have atmospheres, maybe there might be, might be liquid water on their, the surface of these planets. So maybe there might be life there. So the exact number of these so-called habitable planets varies depending on who you ask. But importantly, you can see they're all about the same size of Earth. So that's much smaller than the planets Jupiter and Neptune. However, every single one of those planets orbits a star unlike our own. They all orbit small, cool red stars. We call them M dwarfs. So they are much smaller, much cooler, much more red than our yellow sun. The famous Trappist system, which is shown here, hosts seven Earth-sized planets, four of which are in that gallery I just showed because they might be about the right temperature for liquid water to exist on their surface if they have atmospheres. Now the star in this system is way smaller than the sun. You can see the size comparison here. It's actually not that much bigger than our planet Jupiter. So as yet, we've never found an Earth-sized planet that orbits in a period of about one year around a sun-like star. And that's because it's just really hard to do. And that's because of our detection methods. So taking a direct image of an exoplanet is like trying to take a picture of a pea held right next to a flashlight from a mile away. So right now we mostly use indirect methods like the transit method. So this works by if the orbit of the planet is aligned just right, such that the planet passes in front of its star once the orbit, we can use our telescopes to measure that dip in the brightness. Now, when we measure the brightness over time, we call that a light curve. So these dips in that light curve here if they appear very regularly, can indicate the presence of a planet. And the size of that dip is proportional to the relative size of the planet and the star. So you can imagine that if you have the same size planet, but a much smaller star, that transit depth actually gets a lot bigger and it's much easier to detect. So that's why part of the reason why we've been able to find small planets and small stars. And that's not the only reason. For a smaller, cooler star, if you want to be in the habitable zone, you need to get much closer. So here's the orbit in the upper right of this uh, slide here. And that shows the distance of the outer Trappist planet, Trappist 1G, H. <laughs> so this is right outside the habitable zone of, of Trappist 1. And you compare that to the size of the orbit of the Earth. It's much smaller. So the transit technique, for the transit technique, the orbit needs to be aligned just right that you pass in front of the star. Now it's way more likely that you're gonna be aligned just right to do that if your orbit is much smaller. Also, these orbits take like a few days to complete, which is much shorter than the 365 days that you would need to stare at a sun-like star to observe an Earth, truly Earth-like planet. And not only that, but M dwarfs, these tiny small stars, they are way more common. Uh, in the galaxy than sun-like stars. About 70% of the stars in the galaxy are these small red M dwarf stars. So this is why it is way easier to find warm rocky planets around those small stars. So the question is, is this the best place to look for life in the universe if they are so easy to find and if they're so common? It might not be. This massive explosion that you see on the surface of the sun is a coronal mass ejection. It's a huge explosion of matter and is often associated with giant flares, massive increases in the brightness of the star and lots of high energy radiation comes streaming off the star. You can see I've put the earth perspective in this plot here. It's a tiny blue dot way smaller than this huge explosion. And if we zoom out a bit, we can also see other dangers too. So around the edge um, of this video here is a giant halo of material that you can see. And this is called the solar wind. And it's basically very high energy particles streaming out of the sun. Now our Earth's atmosphere is protected by a magnetic field from this solar wind. But if this wind was a bit stronger or maybe the Earth was a bit closer to the sun, that magnetic field might not be enough. If you're in the habitable zone of an M dwarf, you are much closer to the star, much closer to this stellar wind. Now we have measured a few, but it's really difficult to measure the stellar winds 
of any other stars other than the sun. We have some measurements, but basically we're not sure how strong the stellar winds of M dwarf stars are compared to our sun. Now these massive explosions, which are often associated with big flares, they're a little bit easier to study. We have been able to do that for M dwarfs. There's a recent really cool space mission that we've been using to do that called TESS. It's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And this was launched in 2018, and it measures the light curves, those brightness over time plots of hundreds of thousands of stars. And they are searching for those tiny dips in those light curves that indicate planet, the presence of planets. But we can also use this to study the stars themselves. And we can detect those massive flare events. And they look like this in those light curves. So these are sudden increases in brightness in the light curve of the star. Time is going to the right. And these signals indicate the release of a massive amount of high energy radiation, which may strip away a planet's atmosphere. And this is from a neat study led by Max Gunther, where they searched the light curves of thousands of stars for different kinds of sizes and temperatures. So they counted the fraction of stars which showed detectable flares in two months of observations. And so you can see the temperature of the star going along the, to the right, cooler stars are to the right. And then this just shows you how many of those stars show those observable giant flares in that time. And you can see the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin. And those M dwarfs are much cooler, about 3,000 Kelvin. And the fraction of those stars which show detectable flares shoots up when you go to these smaller stars. Not only are you closer to these flares when you're in a habitable zone around an M dwarf, but these flares also happen way more often, and they are also much more energetic. So what does that mean for our precious thin atmosphere around these rocky M dwarf planets? The honest answer is we don't actually know yet. And that's because we've never been able to detect an atmosphere around a rocky planet around another star. And this, we don't know if this is because that these planets, these atmospheres are so thin that we don't have the technology to observe them yet, or if it, because those flares have stripped them all away. And so the way we study these planets is kind of shown in this picture here. And in it, you can see just how thin the Earth's atmosphere is when it's backlit by the sun. So the light doesn't pass through the main disk of the Earth, but a tiny amount of it streams through the slightly opaque atmosphere that we see. And this is how we study the atmospheres of planets around other stars. It's basically an extension of the transit technique, except this time, when we measure the light curves, we split up the, those light curves into different colors, and we can look at those transit depths, and they will change depending on the color that we're using. And the reason is because there are specific gases in the planet's atmosphere that will absorb very specific colors of light. And they will make the transit depth look deeper. And that's because of the basic structure of atoms. So this is the only slide I have in here that includes atomic physics, don't worry. So on the left side, we have a cartoon of uh, a hydrogen atom. So in the middle, we have a nucleus. And surrounding the nucleus are these shells of electrons. So these are tiny, tiny particles buzzing around the middle of a, an atom. All of the hydrogen atoms look exactly the same. So these tiny electrons can sit in these exact shells, but nowhere else. They can't be anywhere in between them. But they can jump from shell to shell. And they can do this by absorbing a very specific energy of light. And when you look at a rainbow in the sky, that's light being sorted out into its different energies. Purple light to the left of this rainbow you see here, that's higher energy light. And as you decrease in energy, you move through the rainbow. And that red on the right side, that's lower energy light. And you can see there are several strong absorption lines of atomic hydrogen that correspond to these specific jumps that come out of these, as these specific colors. And there are also um, different energies that we can't see with our eyes. So if you would move further to the left of this rainbow, past the purple, you'd move into the ultraviolet light, that's higher and higher energy. And if you move further into the red, you go into the infrared, 
we can't see either of those with our eyes, but we can see these visible lights of hydrogen. And so if you looked at the transit depth of a planet with a bunch of atomic hydrogen in its atmosphere, that planet would look way bigger at these four specific lines. So let's take a look at the Earth in ultraviolet light, actually, so not visible. We can't usually see this with our eyes. But in this new way of looking at the Earth, you can see that there is actually a massive cloud of hydrogen surrounding the Earth, and it extends up to 7,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So there's a very strong absorption line of hydrogen in the ultraviolet. It corresponds to that very lowest level, the jump from that very lowest level to the next level up. So this hydrogen, which isn't really present in the lower atmosphere um, of the Earth, is too light, it kind of drifts all the way up. So this is trickling off at a rate of about 90 tons per day. So Earth is actually losing some of its atmosphere, but very slowly because there are, there are five quadrillion tons of the Earth's atmosphere still left, so we shouldn't worry too much about it. So this is the region of a planet's atmosphere that I'm most interested in because it's where we can see the escape actually happening. So the first planet with its escaping atmosphere to be detected was found using that line of hydrogen in the ultraviolet. And it was around this massive giant planet. It's a Jupiter-sized planet that orbits its host star. Its host star is like the sun, it's very hot. And it orbits that once every few days. So it's a super hot planet about the size of Jupiter. So we call these hot Jupiters. So in the visible light, you would expect this planet to be relatively small. You can see the light curve of that by the blue, no, white dotted line. We expect it to have a transit depth of about 2%. But when you look in this very strong line of hydrogen in the UV, we see that actually the planet blocks out about 10% of the starlight. And so this means that this planet is surrounded by a massive shroud of hydrogen that is streaming off into space because it's being heated up and expanded by a lot of stellar radiation. And here's another transit light curve of another planet in that very same hydrogen line. So the vertical dotted lines here tell you exactly when we expect the planet to start passing in front of the star and to finish pa passing in front of the star. But you can see that these white data points are what we actually measure. And you can see that they start dipping way before that line starts. And they also carry on, they stay low way after. They don't go back up to that straight line like we should expect. And what that means is that this planet is surrounded by a massive cometary-like tail of material that is streaming away from the planet. So this is a top-down view of the system. And so the planet is orbiting around the star on that white dotted line. And the star is like over here off the left of the screen. And there is this really beautiful stream of material that's escaping um, off of the planet. And one reason I'm like really interested about studying these wispy tails trailing behind the planet is because of this really nice work led by John McCann a few years ago. So they show that when you increase the strength of that stellar wind, that's that giant red halo surrounding the sun that we, show, that we saw earlier. When you pump that up, you can carve out the material that's escaping from the planet into these tails, these very fast tails streaming behind the planet. When you don't have much stellar wind there, the, like the left, very left side of the, um, the figure here, the material just sort of wisps around and forms this ring around the star. But when you increase and increase um, the strength of that strong stellar wind, you can sculpt the material and it streams behind, like on the right side. So we can actually use observations of this escaping material to measure those stellar wind strengths, which have been pretty difficult to detect so far. And this is kind of at the cutting edge of what we're able to do today. However, since the, that first detection of hydrogen um, in an exoplanet atmosphere, 20 years ago, there have only been five detections using that same hydrogen line of escaping exoplanet atmospheres. So this means it's very difficult because we want to do a big survey of all different kinds of planets and all the different kinds of stars to understand 
which stars have strong stellar winds, which kinds of planets are able to hold onto their atmospheres. But we've only been able to do this for five very big planets. And this is kind of a problem. Part of the reason it's so difficult is that you can only do that kind of work with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's the only one that can observe in the ultraviolet right now. It's the only one that can, that can see that hydrogen. When I was a PhD student, I used this telescope to look at a different planet. And this time I wasn't looking in the ultraviolet, I was looking in the infrared, so at lower energies. And we were looking at this planet and it's not as hot as that one I showed you before. It's slightly cooler, but still a gas giant. And we were looking for methane in its atmosphere with Hubble. So methane is like in cow farts. Um, we didn't actually detect methane, however. And here is a little picture of astronaut John Grunsfield. He's installing the instrument that we used to uh, make this observation. And what I'm showing you here is a transmission spectrum. So what this is, is we have wavelength along the bottom here. So this is basically the color of the light or the energy of the light. And on the y-axis here, we have the transit depth. So that's how much light the planet is blocking out. And so when you see a peak in this transmission spectrum, a very specific wavelength that corresponds to one of those strong absorption lines of an atom, that tells you that there's a lot of that stuff in this planet atmosphere. And so what this is, this peak here that we saw, is a very strong line of helium. Now helium is the second most common element in the universe after hydrogen. And for these planets that have a lot of hydrogen and helium in their atmospheres, it's a pretty important element to find. Um, people had been looking for this. Uh, well, they started looking in the early 2000s, but it was pretty tough, so they kind of gave up. We discovered this totally by accident. And with this helium, we can also see those massive streams of material escaping from the exoplanet. I was pretty excited uh, when we found this. I was just a PhD student. I wasn't expecting to see something cool like that. And uh, we were like writing up the results and I, the paper hadn't come out yet. But I was uh, visiting Harvard University. Well, I felt very impressed to be there. I was quite nervous. And uh, I went down to coffee and I was like trying to make small talk with some people there. And I started talking to this woman no idea who she was. It turns out she's a very famous stellar astrophysicist, Andrea Dupree. She's very nice. Um, but I was talking to her and I was like, oh, I think we might have found some helium in an exoplanet with this special line in the infrared. Do you know anything about it? And she looked at me and she opened her mouth and she was like, that is my favorite line. Come downstairs. And she, uh, she took me downstairs to the office of um, a theoretical astrophysicist, uh, Antonio Klopcic. Uh, and Antonia was just writing her theoretical model to explain that we should see a bunch of helium with this specific line in escaping exoplanet atmospheres. And she showed me her theory, and then I showed her, her our detection, and we were like, whoa! It was, it was like one of the best moments of my life. It was really fun. Uh, and now Antonia and I are very good friends and we work together. Anyway, the really cool thing about this helium line is that you can observe it with a ton of ground-based telescopes. You don't have to just use Hubble. So there are loads of telescopes that can do this, including Carmenes in Spain, the very large telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Yes. This is the real name of these telescopes, the very large telescopes. I really like it. Um, Gemini South uh, in the Chilean Andes and also Keck, which I use. So these telescopes stand on the summit of Mount Kea. So this has always been a place of reverence for the indigenous Hawaiian community, indigenous Hawaiian community. So anybody like me who gets to use these telescopes is extremely lucky and I'm very grateful. And anyway, all of those telescopes have been pointed at many planets. And in the last five years, we have found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 planets with giant clouds of helium escaping from their atmospheres. And there's more coming this year. Um, and this is in five years compared to five 
uh, with that hydrogen line in the last 19. So these have been made, not by me, by a huge swathe of the exoplanet community. And we're kind of excited about what we can do with this. So all of these planets are all larger than Earth. We haven't been able to do this for rocky planets. But we are starting to use this to understand the stars better. And in general, which planets are losing their atmospheres more quickly around which stars at which distances. And we're pretty hopeful because we think the JWST, the largest, most expensive, most powerful telescope that we've ever launched into space, this can also see helium in exoplanet atmospheres and a bunch of other things. And so we're gradually getting to smaller and smaller planets. And we're gradually starting to learn which ones can hold on to the atmospheres um, for long enough to life to, for life to evolve. We're also directly, or well, more directly, looking deeper into those lower atmospheres of those small rocky planets. So JWST is observing that TRAPPIST system that I mentioned earlier, we might be able to see if that system specifically has held on to its atmosphere for billions of years. We're still not sure if that will work. But if not, we're still approaching the problem from the other direction by trying to under understand the stars and these tails of wispy material. So I'm pretty hopeful. And I'm especially excited to see all of the other stuff that's coming out from JWST. Um, this is a transmission spectrum from a giant planet that was led by my pal, Zafar Rustam Kulov. Uh, in it, they saw just a bunch of stuff. Okay, we've got sodium, water, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, more water, just loads of stuff in there. A lot of this stuff we've never been able to see in exoplanet atmospheres before. So who knows, maybe there might be other hints uh, of atmospheric escape in other weird things, uh, these planet atmospheres. So can exoplanets keep their atmospheres long enough for life to evolve? I don't know. We don't know. Sorry, I don't have an answer to that question today. But we are trying to approach this from every possible angle. And I've, today I've just highlighted like one angle that we could go at this from. So I'm an academic, and sometimes being an academic is pretty hard. Um, there have been quite a few times in my life where I have really struggled with this job and really felt quite alone. I have this image as my desktop background, and very rarely uh, I close all my windows on my computer and I see this. And this usually happens when my computer crashes because of all of those windows that I have open. Uh, anyway, when I see this, I'm reminded that I am a miracle. I am a tiny, fleshy creature somewhere in a galaxy like this, and I'm going about my day, and I have my weekly meetings with other tiny little scientist creatures, and we sit around and we like shake our weird guitar voice boxes at each other, and we vibrate the atmosphere at each other, we make these sounds and we nod our heads and we make weird sounds back at each other. And we're sat there and we're really curious. We're like, are there any other weird scientist creatures out there? Like, let's have a little look uh, just for the fun of it. Um, and in moments like that, uh, I feel very lucky. And I, I look at the number of stars in this galaxy, and I look at the number of galaxies in this um, tiny patch of sky that is the size of a grain of sand held out at an arm's length. And I feel the opposite of alone. Um, and it's moments like this, um, and moments like sharing this with you, wobbling the air at you, and hopefully receiving some of your wobbles back, um, that really keep me going. And, make me feel very lucky to be doing what I do. Uh, so thank you very much for coming here today, despite the horrible rain. Um, and I'd love to chat more with you afterwards. So thanks. I will be taking questions apparently, yes. <laughs> Hello.
just to make sure the online audience can hear this wonderful. Uh, so going back to those stars and when we saw the um, increase of, I think it was like the solar winds um, and other like phenomena around the stars, uh, do we know why it's upwards of like 40% of the M type stars that experience this, but not the like G type or the other ones? Yeah, that's a really great question. We think it's because the structure of these stars is actually significantly different. So inside a star, there are like these different zones. There are these zones um, where there's a lot of like mixing and churning. And there are these zones where they're just like more like stable layers, right? These, depending on like the size of the star, some of these stars have like a big region where it's just these stable layers. And some of these stars have a bigger region where it's like churning and mixing. Um, for the smaller stars, we think they have a way bigger much more of the star is this churning and like mixing region. Um, and it's that churning and mixing that generates these huge magnetic fields at the surface of the star. There's a lot of like motion happening. And it's those, what happens to create these kind of explosions is there's those magnetic fields lines that gets like, they bunch up and they cross over. And when they cross, you have these like huge things. So that's what we think is why uh, it's a, Basically, they had different structures, and there's more magnetic fields, and they're more violent that way. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. Uh, this question is about exoplanet detection, not necessarily about the atmospheres, but um, when you showed the animation at the beginning of the, the time lapse of discovery of exoplanets, mm. in the top left, there was a breakdown of the method of detection. Mm. and in the earlier years, the radial velocity method was you know, like four or five to one mm. dominant over transit. And then at a certain point, but significantly before tests, maybe when Kepler was launched, transit eventually blows by it and becomes like four or five to one. So my, my question, two questions. Prior to whatever instrument led to that spike, Kepler or something else, how were transit detections happening like what kind of telescopes and then second why did the radio why why does the number of radio velocity detections remain pretty static I, I would think that like the over 30 years it would be refined to where you'd see an increase even if you saw an exponential increase in transit you'd still see some kind of increase proportionally of radio velocity too does those questions make sense yeah uh, and those are both great questions i'm gonna actually answer the second one first the second one is actually kind of a function of just like human accident. Um, so the question is why was it radial velocities first for a bit and why was that not steadily increasing? So finding planets with the radial velocity method. So just to explain to everybody else, radial velocity. When you look at a star and a planet system, the planet is going around the star for sure. But the planet's gravity is also affecting the star's gravity. It's also affecting the star. Like as the planet goes round, its gravity makes the star wobble. And so we can see those wobbles, these tiny wobbles. Um, and we can, that's how we can detect planets by seeing the star wobble. So that's the radial velocity technique. That technique is way more expensive and difficult than the transit technique. You need to use spectrographs. You've got to get the whole spectrum of the star and you've got to see it shift. You've got to monitor it for a long time, see these like ups and down wiggles. It's difficult. But that was the first way that people thought that we would find exoplanets because we had an idea that most planetary systems look like the solar system. And if you, for the solar system, honestly, the, the easier way to detect planets for the solar system is the radial velocity technique because the planets are so far away the chances of them transiting is very low right so that's why we started with radial velocity but then when we use radial velocity the actual the first planet that was found with this technique um, was an absolutely massive jupiter-sized planet that took like a few days to go around its star we, we literally had no idea that these things existed it was a huge surprise and so we were like, oh, OK, we should be looking for these things now. Um, those things are way easier to find um, with the transit technique. 
it's way cheaper. You just take a cheap telescope. All you're doing is measuring the brightness of the star. If it's a big planet, you don't even need a very big telescope. So then there was a big rush. So answer your second part of the question, what were the other things that we're looking at um, finding those transiting planets before TESS and Kepler? So there were like a, in the early nine, well, late 90s, early 2000s, people started building these quickly, these very cheap transit surveys using basically off the production line cameras. Um, they just pointed them at the star, at the sky and just measured the brightness of, the, of every, basically every star in the sky that they could see. Ground-based, from the ground, yeah. I actually used to work with one, it's called the WASP survey, the Wide Angle Search for Planets. And actually WASP is like, it was a really good, is a really good um, transit detection one. So, so then the transits like shot up, they found like a few hundred, like the earliest, the easiest planets you could find. There were these massive planets around bright stars that orbited like once every few days. Yeah, so that was a long answer. Uh, did, that, did that answer your questions? Okay, cool. Oh yeah, so oh, actually, sorry. But the reason why radio velocity hasn't like sh shot up as well is because it's like really expensive. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the main reason, especially as we're also, so we're trying to measure the mass with the radial velocity and like smaller planets need like a lot more telescope time to measure that mass. You're also limited because the star is, like I showed you, the star is like pff, doing like crazy like violent stuff and that messes up the observations as well. Yeah, no problems. Hey. So how do amateurs form? Ooh, great question. That's a tough one. <sighs> so when planets form, oh, am I still showing? All right, planets form, right, around baby stars. When they do that, there's like a lot of gas and material that's still hanging around. And so we think, we're pretty sure that when these planets form, they like suck up a bunch of gas as they're swirling around the star. Now, at some point, the, star, the star will heat up the rest of the gas and it'll all disappear. And so you'll just be left with the star and the planet with some gas that, that it's captured. And then all of this other stuff disappears. But we don't know if the planet holds on to that original atmosphere that it just picked up from the same stuff that made the star. It might lose it to space again. And then it might form a different atmosphere. So on the Earth, we think that some of the stuff in our atmosphere actually came from the rocks and volcanoes that like exploded up some, basically some atmosphere from the, from the surface. Also, sometimes there might be comets that come out of space and crash into the earth and like dump a bunch of water on the earth's surface and that becomes the atmosphere. So in short, there's a lot of ways you can form an atmosphere and it's pretty hard to tell for which planets where the atmosphere came from. So we're trying to, we're trying to answer that right now. That's a great question, thanks. One more question from the audience before we switch to the Q&A panel and field questions on all topics. Hello, thank you. Um, you talked about how um, some atmospheres could have been there and then disappeared. Mm. Um, do you also, like, is there a way to tell if it's disappeared at some point? And if so, like, would that be useful if you found, like, signs of liquid water or life, like, is it significant to your research? Yeah, um, also a great question. So in um, astronomy, we have the benefit of that we can look at like a lot of things, but we can only see those things right now. We are not able in astronomy to like run experiments, to like wind back the clock to see if there were, you know, for a given exoplanet, it's pretty hard right now to say what was its atmosphere like previously. So we can try and get around that by just looking at loads and trying to find 
very young planets. Like we try and find very young, we try and find planets are like all the different evolutionary stages. We, we try and like piece them together. Like we don't know, but we can, if we get enough of them, we can assume this young planet will eventually turn into that old planet over there. They're probably about the same. Um, but it's kind of through these methods that we're trying to figure out if we can piece those all together. Um, you know, in the solar system, we have an easier time with that because we have like geological records of like the earth. Like you can go to the Arctic and you can like dig into the ice and the ice that was laid down like a million years ago is like really deep, right? And you just dig that up and it will tell you what was in the atmosphere like a few million years ago. So it doesn't go that far back, but in that way we can, you know, turn back the clock on, on Earth's atmospheres, on the Earth's atmosphere, which we can, and those lessons maybe we can apply to exoplanets. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really tough. Like we also can run like models try and wind back the clock with our like theoretical models um but yeah it's, it's still a work in progress does that answer the question cool thanks all right um we're gonna move on to our q a panel we'll get started in like three minutes or so but please thank a wonderful presentation by our speaker dr jessica space thank you very much So if you'll just be patient, we'll set up a table, we'll turn the lights back on, get rid of the screen, and we'll start. You, you, you guys don't have to, for those of you who showed up late, in case you didn't notice, there are clouds and rain overhead, so we won't be having the telescope viewing. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm just saying we, uh, we don't have the telescopes tonight cause, because, because atmosphere, our own atmosphere. Um, but we'll still do the Q&A panel. You guys are welcome to stick around. You can take off if you just came to see the highlight of the night. And there have been about 15 questions on YouTube that I haven't yet asked, but lots of relevant questions that are really, um, really good. So we'll introduce our panel in just a moment.
Okay. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, doing this on the fly is always fun. Um, all right. So here's our Q&A panel. We'll just go through and everybody introduce themselves and give a brief introduction to the kind of science that we do, because we all do different science from each other. And I think we do, actually, we, we took a census beforehand and we, we, we cover a pretty broad part of the spectrum of astronomy and astronomical topics amongst our, our various different specialties. So I'm Cameron Hummels. I do mostly computational modeling of how galaxies form and change over their lifetimes um, and do a bit of cosmology alongside that. So like how the structure of the universe changes over lar large scales as well. Um, and somebody who does something very different Hello, I'm Ki Cheng. I'm a PhD student here in planetary science. I work on comets and asteroids and related objects in the solar system. Hello, my name is Andreas Feist. I'm originally from Switzerland, but now I live in California, where it's warmer. Um, I look at the first galaxies that are being formed in the universe. So they're very, very tiny little dots that you might have seen on the new JWST images. The tiny red dots, that's the stuff I'm looking at. My name is Sam Rose. I'm a PhD student in the astronomy department. Uh, I'm broadly interested in explosions and the things that will explode, so massive stars, uh, and the things that have exploded, so neutron stars and black holes. Hello, I'm Jessica Spake. I study exoplanet atmospheres, and I'm a postdoc here, actually over the road. It's all one and the same. Um, OK, so we can take questions from the audience in case you didn't get yours fielded thus far. Um, and I also have a number of different questions that have been asked online in case you guys are like, let's take a break for a second, let the online people. So do you, I'll give preference to the, uh, the in-person audience. Are there, there's questions? Okay. Um, just based off like, you know, our big bang model and everything when the universe first started, um, I guess the question for you is uh, when an ex, based off how it expanded from like, you know, nothing basically, um, did, do we know, or do we think it expanded like, like perfectly in like all directions or some areas expanded quicker or slower than other ones? And how did that affect like the structure of the universe? Oh, right. oh, I tore that oh yeah, okay, oh, okay, okay, all right. Um, challenging, challenging question. Uh, so basically, did the universe expand uniformly, both in terms of its speed at which it was expanding, but also its direction? Or are there pockets where, where potentially it expanded faster in this pocket than over here? Like, okay. I don't think that we have a ton of evidence one way or another. I think in general, we, I'm, I'm sure Andreas can chime in on this because he works on early universe stuff as well. But... Um, we do believe, okay, so one thing that we believe based on several different pieces of evidence is in a theory called inflation, the inflationary universe. So that means that in the very early universe, just moments after the kind of the birth of the universe and the Big Bang, that the expansion of the universe occurred exceedingly quickly, um, inflating really quickly. And and that the, the time scale over which it, it is changed in its, in its expansion rate over the history of the universe. Um, and part of that change in its expanding rate is attributed to something known as dark energy. Um, so that is causing it to accelerate and speed up in its expansional, e expansionary rate. Um, but in terms of whether or not it's homogeneous, do you, I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a good question. So one thing we realized is when you look around, it's very isotropic. So there is not really a, a direction that it's preferred or, you know, there's like a gigantic 
thing on the left or something like that, right? Um, so that's basically just describing the universe around us, right? And and that was uh, part of this inflation theory, right? That it has to inflate very quickly, so it it didn't have a chance to you know create this kind of clumps or asymmetric things in the universe. Um, so that's from like observational evidence. But yeah, as as Cameron said, we, we don't really know, right? You cannot. You know, it's it's like you're you're standing in the forest, right? And you want to measure how big the forest is, right? It's kind of it's almost impossible. Challenging question, and you, sir. So, um, you talked about us being like little fleshy scientists here on the Earth. Let's say you were a little fleshy scientist somewhere else, non-specifically. What would be your best way to look at the Earth and identify that it was a habitable place or, um, you know, somewhere where there might be life? Um, I would say that the best thing would be direct imaging of that planet. So this is a really cool technique we have when it's just taking pictures of planets. It's really hard to do because the stars are so bright. You have to like block out the light from the star. Um, I think that is really the way that we expect that we will be able to see truly Earth-like planets in the future. And then when you do direct imaging, you can get direct, like the direct light that's coming from the, the star, the planet, sorry. So you can kind of see its atmosphere we don't think we're going to be able to resolve it. So it will still be like a single point, but we will be able to see, um, you know, break up that point of light into all the different wavelengths or the different energies of light. We might be able to detect signatures in the atmosphere of those planets. You know, in the Earth's atmosphere, all of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, basically most of it came from life. It wasn't put there by the rocks. And we have like ozone and like methane and other stuff that life put in there. So people call those biosignatures. And so a lot of people think that the best way to look for signatures of life is by looking for biosignatures in the earth, in the atmospheres of earth-like planets, probably through direct imaging. But we need, we don't have the telescopes to do that yet. We need way bigger telescopes in space that we don't have. Um, I think it's still pretty difficult. And I think to do that, you really have to understand the atmospheres very well because there are very many ways you can fake biosignatures. Um, recently, we found some, anyway, it's, we need to really understand the atmospheres properly to know whether it's from life or from something else. Um, oh, another question. Oh, yeah. It, it, just to piggyback off of that, if, if, if you were a, if you were, if there were intelligent life on, let's say, Proxima Centauri B, which is like four light years away, we've been putting out radio and television signals from the Earth for 80 years, more than that, radio for 100 years at least. So could those theoretically be picked up at that distance? Would they be so attenuated that they wouldn't be intelligible or like what? what could that be a way? I mean, obviously, there's a limited number of exoplanets we know of within like a hundred light year range. But is that could that theoretically be a way that, to his question, that somebody on one of those planets could detect that there's something not something that's not a natural, mm. you know, transmission? Sure. I I think it's important to um, distinguish between the types of life that people are looking for. So most of the people that I work with. Um, or, you know, the kind of stuff that I'm doing. I guess the kind of life that we're really expecting to find is not in the intelligent life that you're talking about. So for most of Earth's history, there's been no, none of that kind of life, not like technology, as you would call it. Like most of it has just been bacteria, dominated by bacteria. And so the chances are, if you see a habitable, if you just look at a random time, if you look at a habitable planet, we think that the, we don't know how long human civilization is going to last, but we do know that bacteria have lasted for billions of years. So that's why, you know, we're hedging up me and, you know, people who are focused on, on their atmospheres, hedging our bets that that's the most likely way that we'll find it. I think it's really exciting question though, um, techno signatures, because honestly, personally, I 
um, you know, I don't know how, it's very difficult for humans to travel between the stars, but it's, I think a lot easier, it will be a lot easier for robots to travel between the stars. And so signatures of like techno future technologies um, is a pretty interesting thing to think about and very uncertain. You did hit on a good point though, in the radio waves or any kind of um, light or electromagnetic signal that you just beacon out in random directions from uh, a planet, um, the further you go away, um, the weaker the signal gets. You can like focus lasers at like specific points in the sky. And so some people think about um, civilizations who specifically target all of the stars in their neighborhood with like lasers in that kind of that kind of stuff. There's also other like weird ways that people think tech, um, civilizations might leave their marks by putting weird things in weird orbits um, around stars that would make um, very clear signals of life. Um, but yeah, I, I am not 100% sure how um, easy it will be to, or how, I think it's very difficult to estimate the likelihood of finding a technology like that, when the main thing we don't know is how long technological civilizations last, I think. Right. Right. I think I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm um, not. Yeah. I. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. Sorry. Well, I. They sound like intelligence with great taste. Uh, I don't know. Hi. Um, so I know that the atmosphere is very important for fostering the emergence of life. So on another planet, even if there wasn't an atmosphere, would a body of water, would that serve a similar purpose of um, an atmosphere for fostering life? Yeah, it's a great question. So in the solar system, we have a couple of moons of the giant planets further out that have massive oceans of water under a surface of solid ice. People are really excited about the chance of finding life in those oceans. They have like a heat source as well. Those, the cores of these planets, well, not planets, moons, are like heated by like tidal gravity as they go around the planet so that they that, and that's what melts these water, this water ocean and keeps it liquid. And there are, we think, the ingredients of life in these um, oceans. And we are sending probes to try and like look at the escaping plumes from these. Um... So yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of people who think you can form life in these oceans, even if you don't have an atmosphere. Um, yeah, I think you still need like a special set of uh, a special environment because you you still need it maybe protected by the um, solar wind and radiation somehow and still have a heat source from somewhere to keep it liquid if you don't have the atmosphere protecting it yeah related to that there was a question online about the presence of oceans on exoplanets and would it be possible uh, so roger i asks this and he he asked if I can paraphrase, um, you know, we, we can figure out the wobble of a star and figure out that there's a planet orbiting around it causing the star to wobber, wobble. Can we also figure out something about the distribution of stuff on the surface of a planet, like sloshing oceans or something like that, that would wobble the planet that might show up in the wobble? Or is that, is, is that too far from like our detection limits and what our instruments can pick out? Um, yeah, I, sorry, I feel like I'm you're the exoplanet <laughs> person, so it's, it's okay. Uh, so right now we are approaching the level where we could detect the wobble of Earth-like planets around sun-like stars when we, we're like getting, there's a ton of experts in California who are working on this. Um, so that's to do the wobble of the sun caused by the planet. I actually have never thought about the sloshing around of, um, liquids on a planet to see the wobble of the planet itself. 
That's a really good question, actually. I think it seems like there'd be a tidal effect from it. Yeah, you're, you're I distributing mass. On the yeah, surface. but so right now, you know, we have maybe like ten or twelve systems where we've detected direct light from the exoplanet itself. So I imagine that you probably want it would probably want to be a direct detection of the light from the planet, and then you get that um, wobble. So I think, and all of those planets we found are like massive gas giants, so they don't have, you know, right. solid surfaces. But that's a really cool idea. I right. like it. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll cite you, Tune Roger. Back in. When yeah, you, uh, I will credit we, you on my next paper out. about that topic. There's a question from our young audience member here. Uh, so how do atmospheres affect planets? How do the atmospheres affect planets? <laughs> yeah. Okay. How do the atmospheres affect planets? Hmm. Do they change the dynamics of the planet? Do they change yeah. the surface properties of the planet? Do yeah. They... And you like the Earth's uh, surface has been like weathered by uh, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, you know, when you go and look at some like cool rock formations, the wind is like blown through them and kind of changed the shape of the rocks. Um, sand dunes? Yes, yeah, sand dunes. And actually, so uh, in the solar system, there are some kind of sand dunes on this moon called Titan. It has a very thick atmosphere. It's the thickest um, atmosphere of any moon in the solar system. And you can see these dunes, sand, like sand dunes of like water ice. And like there's winds that whip around and like, we're learning about those winds from looking at the shape of those dunes. And so, yeah, the atmospheres can affect the surface. And by looking at the, how it, the surface is affected, we can learn more about these atmospheres. Um, so yeah, great idea, I like it. Just a question from a new audience member. I was wondering if there are any current methods to gauge the isotopic composition of an exoplanet's atmosphere and if we could detect any isotopic fractionation from that. Did you get that? Yeah, Pete, yeah. So the, if there's any way to look at the isotopic ratios of things in a planet's atmosphere. So uh, an isotope, so when I showed that picture uh, of a atom, you got the nucleus in the middle and a bunch of electrons around the outside. So inside the nucleus, you have protons and you have, oh, the whiteboard, yeah. We've got protons and neutrons. <laughs> yep, all right. So, yeah, great. Can I just like, cool, right. Can we do like, can we, can we do like deuterium and hydrogen? So we just get rid of one of those. Right, so this is one way you can make hydrogen. And then this is another. We'll just actually, sorry, I'll do that as well. <laughs> so we've got a P here and an N, and we got just a P. So in the in the nucleus, you can have these protons. These have a positive charge, and these are like the really important ones for telling you what this atom is. So a hydrogen atom always has one proton. But there are these other things called neutrons. So they have no charge, but they have mass. And they can hang around in the um, nucleus. It's still hydrogen, still have one proton, but this one has uh, one neutron and this one doesn't. So this is heavier than this thing, even though it's still hydrogen. And this means this hydrogen, like chemically is the same, has the same kind of reactions. But like if you had like a, a bunch of hydrogen in a bottle, the right sort of temperature maybe some of the heavier ones might like sink to the bottom because they have this extra neutron so so these are isotopes the an, a different isotope has a different number of neutrons in the nucleus so this is really cool because like the these uh isotopes are affected by like a bunch of different processes in different ways. So you can learn things about like, oh yeah, how much hydrogen did it start with? And how much of this light hydrogen with no, neut with no neutron got like sifted off into space? Cause this is, cause it's lighter, it's probably easier to lose. 
So yeah, this is this is what an isotope is. This is why we're interested in them for planetary science, especially atmospheres. And the answer to your question is, we are trying to do this, but it's very hard. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> the uh, the signals of different isotopes, the different um, effects they have are like really small, smaller than the precision that we have of our telescopes right now. It's really cool. I think in the future when we have bigger telescopes, um, we might be able to see. I think some people are maybe trying to do it with JWST because like there are some like carbon bearing species that look kind of slightly with different isotopes that look kind of slightly different. But no one's done it yet, but people are trying. So it's, yeah. Cool. Um, there was a there was a question online uh, from one of the online audience members about uh, a, a recent paper that came out that's been all over the news, at least all over the science news. And if we had any opinions about this paper. So the paper is a very controversial paper suggesting that there's a relationship between black holes, which is something that we don't really understand. We understand some aspects of black holes, but not all the things about black holes. And if there's a relationship between those and dark energy, which is another thing that we don't really understand. In fact, we understand, I think, a lot less about dark energy than we do about black holes. Dark energy, as I alluded to before in the question in addressing uh, the one that you'd asked, is this kind of strange thing that we we, we describe as being responsible for the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So the universe is getting bigger over time, it's expanding outward, and dark energy appears to be accelerating that rate over which it's expanding. And uh, the, so did you guys read this paper? No? Oh, so I'm, I'm here, I'm stuck by myself, not having read the paper very in depth. Well, I'm not an expert on this topic, but I will try and posit what, what was written in the paper. So the idea is that there's a relationship between these two things. And uh, what's described in this paper is that there is a relationship between the mass of a black hole, of a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. We think that most galaxies contain a supermassive black hole in their center. It's difficult to get constraints on the properties, even the mass of that black hole, because, because they're black holes. They're dark and they're hard to find. And I mean, oh, Peter, did you read this paper? You did? Do you want to get up here and help me with this or no? Oh, you'll probably do better than me. Uh, well, shout out if I'm wrong on any of the things that I state here. Um, so basically, uh, the authors, based on previous evidence, there seems to be some relationship between the mass of a black hole and the mass of the galaxy that contains it. And what people have previously found is that um, between redshift of two, which is some distance away from us and some time in the past and the present day, uh, the the, the black holes appear to be getting bigger and more massive relative to the size of the galaxies. 10 billion years. 10 billion years, thank you. 10 billion years ago to present, the black holes appear to be getting larger relative to the size of the galaxies, statistically speaking. We aren't watching a single galaxy change over that period and watching the galaxy or the black hole get bigger. We're just seeing that this, there's this relationship. But even that is contested. That that whole relationship, because it's really hard to do this and it's not clear. Some, some authors will describe the reverse thing, that galaxies are shrinking relative to the size of these black holes. Um, so that all, already calls this a, a little bit into question. But the argument that, as far as I can tell, is being made by the authors is that um, rather than those being black holes in the centers of these galaxies, they're actually some sort of exotic object that looks like a black hole from the outside, but actually is uh, a, it's a huge ball of energy that's the quantum background energy, the quantum rest energy. And, and that somehow, as the universe expands and accelerates in its, in its expansion, it's causing those balls of energy to grow and thus the supermassive black holes appear to grow relative to the size of the galaxy. But as I hopefully demonstrated, I don't fully understand uh, this, this, uh, this argument. 
And in talking with other colleagues in, in the department there, it's, who are more expert on this, it seems like there's a lot of, it seems like we don't have enough, um, let's see, what's a good analogy? If, if I go outside, this is, maybe this isn't the greatest analogy, but if I go outside and I see a flashing light in the distance, what is that flashing light probably? One could say, oh, it's an airplane. Oh, it's somebody with a flashlight shining it all over the place. Oh, it's, you know, uh, a bird with a flashlight attached. There are a variety of different suggestions for what, what that could be, rationalizations for what that could be. I could be hallucinating in the desert, but if you immediately go and say, that's an alien, that it seems like there are much more likely explanations for the observation that you've made than to in, invoke some sort of kind of exotic and wild explanation for that thing. And in this case as well, it seems like there are more mundane, more, uh, more kind of probable explanations for the observation of do supermassive black holes grow at a different rate than their galaxies over the evolution of the universe that you don't have to create some sort of wild explanation and the only reason you would start to create wild explanations is, is if you've ruled out all of those kind of easy to explain things that don't break our model of cosmology or, or cause craziness. So that seemed to be the general conclusion of the people with whom I spoke about this is that you don't have to invoke something quite so exotic to explain this relationship. Peter, is that roughly consistent with your take on it? Okay since he's more of a black hole expert than me in the audience. Thank you, Peter. Okay, sorry for that side topic. I, I wanted to break from the straight exoplanet atmospheres question. Uh, you have a question? Um, back to exoplanets. Uh, <laughs> um, so you talked about stellar flares and the possibility of them you know, stripping atmospheric elements from a planet. My understanding is that there's a school of thought that says that that posits that maybe like radiation in the form of stuff getting spewed from a star or other 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 sources um, could be actually be essential to the formation of life. Like like it acts like a galvanic, you know, kickstarts a process. So a process by which life forms. So do you have any thoughts on that? And you know, where do you? come down in that school of uh, with that school yeah. of thought um so the study that i showed where they like searched tests with like a, the like a bunch of flares um and they found like the m dwarfs have like loads and loads of flares they did specifically look at these kinds of flares that people have suggested as like necessary for the um for, like giving that spark um uh to life um I think they found that those kind of flares aren't actually that energetic. And um, the, the bigger the flare you have, you know, the more dangerous it is to the actual atmosphere itself. So those are indeed more common for these smaller planets, but also so are the ones that, um, yeah, will just strip away the atmosphere. Um, I don't actually know too much more about it, but um, I don't think, many people know. I think we still don't know if they can maintain any atmosphere, which I think is the question to start with um, before we can answer that. But yeah, maybe though, if they can retain their atmospheres, then maybe they are more likely to start kickstart life with these flares. Definitely is a possibility. That would be sick, yeah. That's a scientific term, Nick yeah. is a scientific <laughs> term. Okay. Um, let's see. I have a, a related question um, about comets that might be appropriate for a keychain. So Kieran Mehta asks, back in 1986, I participated in an international Comet Halley Watch project that collated various observations by spacecraft, observatories, and amateur astronomers from all around the world. Um, 
are there, why haven't projects like this internet, this um, international Halley watch happened since either for this comet or for other comets? And what is kind of just in general, can you speak to, since I know you're a comet observer, um, can you speak to like, what, what are the ways in which we detect comets and then continue to observe them to better understand their orbits and their trajectories and their implications in the inner solar system? Right, sure. Yeah, so uh, it's actually been a, quite a number of different uh, comet observing campaigns since the 1980s. Uh, so of varying degrees of uh, complexity and spacecraft and involvement and size. Uh, so in the last decade or so, we've had uh, the biggest one was probably the Comet ISON campaign, which is back in 2012, 2013. This was a big, uh, it's actually a, not that big of a comet, but a, a sun grazing comet that uh, came from the Oort cloud and uh, was uh, destroyed by the sun in November, on Thanksgiving actually, Thanksgiving day of 2013. And so the, there was the, basically this comet that was found still out in the outer solar system about a year before it was to have this close approach to the sun. And lots of people got super excited about it. And because it's not very often that we get like an ice ball that's diving straight into the sun or almost straight into the sun. And so there was a huge campaign involving maybe a dozen different spacecraft, as well as number of a uh, large number of amateur astronomers as well. And of course, many uh, standard uh, ground-based professional observatories as well. And so this comet was observed by the Hubble, uh, Spitzer, uh, even one of the Mars rovers, I think got it. Uh, spacecraft around uh, the messenger spacecraft that was around Mercury at the time also observed it, uh, as, as well as the solar coronagraphs we have in the vicinity of Earth, among a huge armada of other things. That how, I forget. how bright was it? Uh, so this comet peaked at around magnitude minus three or so. So it's about the brightness like of Venus. Yeah, not quite as bright as Venus, uh, maybe about yeah, somewhere between Jupiter and Venus in the sky. Uh, but it only got to this brightness when it was a few degrees away from the sun. And uh, the hopes were that it would stay intact on its passage around the sun, and then it would get super bright in the weeks after Thanksgiving, uh, which it didn't because it was destroyed by the sun. <laughs> and so in the past, if you look through the past few centuries of like bright comets, the vast majority of extremely bright comets that you see in historical records, uh, the ones that like have tails stretching like 100 degrees in the sky that uh, people get confused by like, why is there a random searchlight that's like shining into the sky? Those, the vast majority of those tend to be these so-called sun grazing comets because comets, they, they're not intrinsically that bright. I mean, they're just like a ball of rock and some ice that's, and they're, like really small few kilometers in size but they only get bright because they're heated by the sun and they get heated by the sun a lot if you put them really close to the sun and so the brightest of these are uh, these sun grazing comets that you basically put right up to maybe like one solar radius away from the sun or so or less than that uh, and they can potentially get very bright because of all this stuff coming off of it or at least if they're big enough, more than like a couple of kilometers in size or so. And so the last really bright one of these was probably back in 1965, which is Comet Ikea Seki, which got up to about magnitude minus 10 or so in the daytime sky. So it's visible, it's about as bright as the moon. Wow. And you could, there are stories of people to basically just hold their hand right up to the sun, block it out. And there's basically this just bright comet that's like right next to it. That's wild. And so there were some hopes that this comet Ison would do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, this was not a multi-kilometer size comet. This was a probably around half kilometer to one kilometer size comet that wasn't quite big enough to survive its way around. And so uh, it did not end up being a particularly bright comet in the night sky, at least. Uh, but 
on in the anticipation that it might be extremely bright and interesting there was a huge campaign launch to study it mm. and if you go and online and like look up papers relating to like the comet ice sun observing campaign in fact you'll find a large number of different papers including many uh using that compile results from like the amateur campaign where people because like professional astronomers we can't like monopolize all the observatories <laughs> around the world to like look at a single comet as much as we'd want to because... as much as you'd want to <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I dig comets. I like comets, but everybody, everybody, yeah, everybody wants to use it for their own science. Yeah, and and so we can't like just take up like all one hundred percent of it, all the observatory's time to like look at a comet to see how it like rotates and stuff. And so it's in times like that where contributions from amateurs are extremely useful because they can help cover and fill in the gaps in what the comet looks like in between. And so we can see like the jets of gas and dust that are emitted by the comet as it rotates, which helps us figure out things like what's its rotation rate and uh, how big it is. Mass loss rate. Yeah, yeah exactly. And thing, things of that nature that are just hard to find from single observation. And so there are campaigns like this. And so that was the big one. There were a few more more recently. Uh, there's the Comet uh, 41, 45, and 46P campaign, basically just a set of three periodic comets that came by in like 2017 and 18 or so. A lot fainter, but of a similar nature uh, involving the amateur community. And as more bright comets that are uh, not of the uh, well, so there are basically, if in the sky at any moment, there's usually at least a dozen comets that are observable at any moment. And so every now and then there are ones that are brighter than others. And as more and more those are found by future surveys, and most of these are just surveys that are constantly scanning the sky every clear night, looking for anything in the sky that moves, most of which are asteroids, which are not very icy for the most part, so do not emit gas and dust. But some of these moving objects do. Those are the comets. And every now and then, one of those will have an interesting orbit of some sort, whether it's that it takes it very close to the sun or it takes it close to the Earth. And when that happens, there will be uh, campaigns of this sort that involve amateurs and professionals to generate better science. Cool. Thank you. That was great. I love these things because I learned a bunch of stuff too. Thanks for coming. Andreas, this is for you. Um, I saw a couple of days ago, I saw a story about that the JWST, uh, that someone observed with the JWST, that there are galaxies that formed like, that, that appear to have formed like 600 million years after the Big Bang, much earlier than we previously thought. So I guess I'm just curious what you thought, if you saw that, or what you thought of it, and then if that is confirmed, how does that change? you know, our understanding of, of the timeline of the formation of the early universe. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting, right? I mean, before JWST, we didn't even know that these things exist, right? Because we were just limited in, in what we can see. So, so, the, so give a good bit of background. So when you, so how do you find those galaxies, right? So basically you have this, I think it came up when Cameron was was uh, answering a question. There's this redshift, right? So basically, what happens is um, when uh, uh, because of the expansion of the universe, um, the galaxies that are far away they actually move away from us, and so that's basically like a, a Doppler shift that we can you know hear when a car passes by, right? So the sound changes depending on if the car is approaching or driving away from us, like the ambulance or so. Um, so the same thing happens with light, right? So when you have something that's moving away from you, it's the light is red shifted, so it appears red. So I always say when you have a, a traffic light and you drive towards the traffic light very quickly, you know, roughly with the speed of light, um, your traffic light turns blue, right? And when you drive away from it, it turns red, right? So it's kind of funny. Um, probably get a speeding ticket. 
Um, and so, so far, so when you, and, and then um, what we found is that when galaxies are farther and farther away, they move away from us more quickly than galaxies that are close. Right, so now what happens is when you want to observe those 600 million year after the Big Bang galaxies, you need to look into the red, right? Because you, you wouldn't see them by eye because they are so red shifted, you, you can't see them. So they are at the, the red part of the spectrum that um, uh, Jessica showed before. Um, and so with the JWST, we're finally able to see them, um, right? So we, there are different types, uh, challenges how to measure them. So we can take a spectrum. So we look at some emission lines and just see how redshifted they are. And that's how we can get a redshift. And so we know a distance to those galaxies. Um, and, um, and the other way is to just look the, at the color. So we take images and see, you know, there's a red dot. Okay, that might be a galaxy that's formed 13.1 billion years ago, which is 600 million years after the Big Bang. Age of the universe is about 13.7 billion years. Um, and so what, what is kind of amazing is that now we can actually not only confirm the distance to those objects and therefore the age, so in the, in the cosmic time, right? So 600 million years after Big Bang, we can also with the spectrum, we can see how many stars they are forming, what are the chemical compositions? I mean, not like, we don't see like uh, all those lines in, as in the, in the exoplanets, right? So it's, it's much, uh, broader what, what we can learn about so but we can you know learn how many metals are in those galaxies right how much dust in those is in those galaxies and what's interesting is that some of those galaxies they are very they have, they have a lot of metals already right so and what does this mean right in, or, in, in order to create metals you have to form stars and that takes a while right so you need a couple hundred million years to form enough stars to have a metallicity that's about the one that you know has our Milky Way, um, and so so those detections they basically allow us to constrain our models of how galaxies are forming, right? And so the farther back you go in time, so the higher redshift, and you find those galaxies, it kind of pushes our models a little bit. And so what we have found is there are very massive galaxies, so ten to the eleven solar masses, so ten to eleven suns. Um, or 10 to the 10, which Compared is very with our own Milky Way, which is 10 to the 12. Yeah, roughly, right. So, so, so almost as massive as our Milky Way, but formed 13 billion years in the past. Yeah. Right? So how, how do you make this thing? And much smaller, right? So galaxies, they don't only grow in, in, in mass, right? Because they're forming stars. Like our Milky Way forms about, I don't know, one or two stars per year. Those galaxies, um, maybe form hundreds, right? When you go back in time. Um, um, but they're also physically smaller, right? Because they're also growing in size, right? So you have those very compact little things, um, factors of 10 smaller than our Milky Way, um, and they're forming a lot of stars and they already are that massive, right? So, so um, but again, there is, so this can channel, uh, challenge the whole, understanding of our universe, right? So how mass forms, how galaxy clusters form, um, how, you know, galaxies form. Um, but on the other hand, there are a lot of uncertainties in these models as well, right? Um, so just to give an example. So when you, when you have one of those star forming clouds, right? That, that you showed in your talk um, and you form stars, we don't really know what's the distribution of those stars. Are those mostly heavy stars that are being formed? or are those mostly low mass stars are being formed, right? And so this, what we call the initial mass function for star formation, that might change over time. So in the early universe, maybe you form more massive stars, more, more massive stars than you, you form in, in today's universe, like in our Milky Way, right? So these are model uncertainties. And if you play with them, you can actually make um, this work, right? So it's, it's a similar thing that Cameron was saying before, you know, there are some knobs you can turn in your models, right? some simple explanations to, to explain those massive galaxies in the universe. Yeah, but, but just from a, from a personal uh, perspective, it's we were trying with Hubble and with Keck really hard, you know, like 10 hour exposures, you know, to get like a single line of this galaxy. And now JWST, you know, an hour, you get the whole spectrum, you know? 
so it's it's really um, it's really amazing what we can do now and um, and these are only a couple right so we will find a lot of more of them and we can actually at some point um, get the statistics right of how many uh, you know of metal more metal rich galaxies are at this epoch in time and and that really constrains our model of galaxy formation so it's very important yeah we're definitely I, I'd say at at this time because of the launch of JWST at a transition point in our understanding of of how things are evolving in the early early universe yeah, especially also what you're doing right with simulations right so how you form those galaxies yeah, if we can make theoretical models that are consistent with the observations that we have. And right now, not all of them. We can't, like, we can't, we can't create galaxies of that mass that quickly. Um, not at least with the observational characteristics that exist. But this is always an iterative thing. You, you work with what you have and then you... Yeah, one other thing is that there are also always selection biases, right? So we find the most extreme objects usually because they have strong emission line or they're very bright you know um there are a lot of that might be just uh, you know outliers right of the and, and they don't probe the general population of galaxies at this time um there was a there's a question online that i think would be well directed at sam which is um why do stars die and you know, we look up in the sky, we see stars, and they appear to be, at least from our perspective, just like kind of constants. So why do they, you know, what's the time scale over which they die and why, why do they die and what do they leave? Yeah, this is a great question. And it's something that I'm really interested in and in trying to understand the population, not just of stars that are going to die, but then the stars that explode and we see those explosions and also the population of objects left behind from them. So black holes, neutron stars and white dwarfs. So basically the big, basic picture of a star is it is uh, a ball of gas that's held together by gravity and it is held up by pressure. Um, and that pressure, you need to have very high temperatures to support that much mass. And the things that's providing your very high temperatures is you are fusing in your cores. So like a um, hydrogen bomb, or if you remember in the news, maybe a couple weeks ago, there was a hydrogen fusion where you got more energy out than you got in. That's the same thing that's powering uh, stars like the sun, uh, more massive stars like that. Uh, but in order to fuse hydrogen, you need to have hydrogen. So there comes a point in a star's lifetime where it's used all of its hydrogen, it's fused all of its hydrogen into helium. It doesn't have any more that it can fuse. Um, and then it needs to do something else um, in order to support itself. So it's no longer fusing hydrogen. Uh, there's no longer the energy that sort of is supporting the star and it starts to contract. So for a while, you can just go on to fusing heavier elements. So you can fuse uh, helium into heavier elements. You can fuse all the way up to, uh, on the periodic table, to iron. Now, when you get to iron, you actually reach a peak in sort of the amount of energy per nucleon. Um, if you go to elements that are heavier than iron, instead of getting energy when you fuse, you actually uh, lose energy. And if you go sort of to the other extreme, if you consider really heavy elements like uranium and sort of all the radioactive elements, um, they will fission instead and you get energy from fission. So that's how most nuclear power reactors here on Earth operate. But the problem is with stars, okay, they're not, they're not fissioning things. They need to fuse in order to get that energy. And so when they reach this iron bit, they have a problem. They no longer have any energy to create the pressure they need to support themselves and they collapse under gravity. Um, and from there, a couple things can happen. So a uh, star like the sun and stars that are, you know, comparable in mass and less massive, uh, they tend to live longer because they're less bright. And so they use up their energy more slowly. Um, and their cores sort of won't actually even get to, to fusing things like iron. They sort of top out around carbon or oxygen. Um, and they're sort of done at that point. Um, and they sort of blow some of their mass off and are sort of just left with a degenerate core. So uh, the degenerate core is supported not by gas pressure, so by something that's like hot in temperature, but just by like the rules of quantum mechanics where you can't fit more things into a smaller thing. Um, and so the degenerate thing left over for low mass stars like our sun is a white dwarf. So in about 7 billion years, 
uh, our sun will sort of reach the end of its ability to fuse hydrogen. It'll puff up in its thing, it sort of blow off its outer layers, and it'll just be left with a white dwarf. And we observe these white dwarfs in our galaxy. Um, the stars that I'm really interested in are stars that are maybe more than eight times the mass of our sun. Um, and when they, they confuse almost all the way up to iron and they do something much more exciting than sort of just blowing off their outer layers and, and being degenerate, they can actually explode. So once you sort of get that last little bit of pressure support uh, lost, your outer layers will come down and they'll hit your hard iron core, that your hard core that can't, can't compress. And so when they hit back, they'll bounce like a bouncing ball back out. Um, and we see that as an explosion. We see that as a supernova explosion. Um, interestingly, you could actually sort of have two paths for these massive stars. So either you sort of had this explosion um, and maybe you are left with something very dense in the center uh, supported by a different kind of degeneracy pressure. This would be a neutron star. Or maybe you hold on to your mass and instead of exploding back out, you actually have enough mass to collapse entirely to a black hole. You collapse down to a single point. Um, and I think one of the most interesting questions in astronomy right now, at least for me, is what determines whether a massive star will explode and become a neutron star or implode and become a black hole? Do you guys know that? No. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was mostly just determined by the the mass of the star that's undergoing that explosion. If it's massive enough, oh, so it's not. So, so yeah, you would think, okay, if your star is beyond a certain point, um, then you have enough mass to clap down to a black hole. It actually turns out that your internal structure is much more important. Hmm. The idea of whether you're gonna pull, push back out and get rid of a lot of your material or collapse back down to a black hole. I, I, I feel confident in saying that we don't have a clear answer um, and it really depends on our understanding. So. Uh, people sort of, you can come out at this from two perspectives. You can watch explosions happen and try to understand them. The problem is this, with this is you mostly see the environment around the star when you see the explosions. You can learn stuff about the energy, you can learn stuff about that, but you don't really sort of know the internal structure of your, of your thing that exploded right before it exploded because you don't, you don't see it. Um, you actually you just see the explosion. Right? Because it's too bright? It's too far too away. Much usually. Oh, okay. So most of the explosions we observe aren't in our own galaxy. They are in other galaxies very far away. I think supernova 1987A was the brightest supernova in, and like it was, 200 years. yeah, less like, yeah, 200 years or so. And that was in one of the satellite galaxies in Milky Way. Uh, but most of the supernova we observe, most of the supernova we see are all in other galaxies very, very far away. So you can't actually see what exploded. You can just say, you look at the galaxy and you say, okay, now there is something there that wasn't before. You don't actually see the thing that exploded. So I know there's a lot of talk, especially in the last few years, about the star Betelgeuse that's very bright in the sky. It's a red supergiant. It's in the constellation of Orion. You've probably seen it if you've looked up in the sky. Um, and we think it's going to turn into a supernova at some point in the next either days or thousands of years. But if it were to go and undergo a supernova explosion, would, because we have so many observations of it, because it's so close and so bright, would we be able to kind of constrain this mechanism by which a star either turns into a black hole or it turns into a neutron star based on its, the mechanics of its explosion? Yeah, so Betelgeuse exploding would be really exciting for people who study supernova. We would love a supernova in our own Milky Way and we're overdue for one actually. So hopefully in the next 10 years, um, we'll actually get to see one in our own galaxy. I mean, it's like, you want this star which is quite close. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> not too close. Um, I'm a little, uh, yeah, Betelgeuse is pretty close. Maybe I don't want Betelgeuse to explode. I want one that's a little bit further than Betelgeuse <laughs> to explode. I don't want to suffer any ill effects, but I would love to watch the explosion. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think so. From what I remember reading, it's not necessarily so close that it's a danger to like blowing off our atmosphere or radiating everyone on the solar system, but it would be a spectacle in the sky. It would be much like some of the supernovae that exploded in the last thousand years that were in our galaxy, such that it's so bright that it's as bright as like the full moon in the sky, kind of like Keechang was talking about with this comet, um, but this is a star exploding. And it would be as bright as that for a period of weeks 
um, as it slowly fades and that sort of thing. But yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a danger, hopefully. hopefully. It might mess with satellites and stuff, but I think sure. we're in more, I think, I don't know if it's entirely clear how much the, the solar wind will prevent stuff from getting in. I think, I think most people think Betelgeuse will be, will be fairly safe. I think you have to be a little bit closer. It's a few hundred, yeah. I don't, it was, I don't remember exactly. Is it eight? Yeah. It's a few hundred, yeah. It's pretty far. It's not like Alpha Centauri or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, we would have a similar problem where with Betelgeuse exploding or any other star in our own, or in our own galaxy, A, you can't see into the interior of a star just by looking at it. You sort of just see the photosphere. It's like trying to look through at the bottom of the ocean um, just by like looking at the surface. It's really, really challenging. Um, you can do, uh, there's a technique called astroseismology where you sort of just look and see how the surface of a star uh, is changing. And that can tell you a little bit about its internal structure. And that's something that would be really interesting uh, for red supergiants. I think one of the most interesting um, probes of the interiors of massive stars, uh, especially in our own Milky Way, will actually be neutrino emission. So neutrinos aren't like um, like photons, which will get stuck in matter, right? Neutrinos will mostly free stream out um, and then we'll be able to see those. So you actually should detect a whole bunch of neutrinos before the actual explosion happens. And I think, I think those neutrino detections will tell us something extremely interesting about um, about the supernova explosion itself, because it's going to be probing that structure at a at a very early time in the explosion that you just don't get with with photons. Um, if Betelgeuse explode, would that affect any of the telescope or any of the equipment we have here on Earth that would affect how we view the space? So you would want to adjust your exposure times based on how bright something is. Just because something is bright in the sky doesn't mean it's going to like damage the telescopes, right? The sun is in the sky all the time and it's very bright. Um, and you choose where you point things um, appropriately. So with something really bright, you just don't have to uh, collect as many photons. Uh, you don't have to collect photons for as long to get the same number of photons as you do when you're looking at something that's really dim. But it wouldn't like damage our telescopes or anything if that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. So there are already, depending on your telescope and sort of uh, your tolerance for light pollution and sort of what you're observing is like how close you can be to the moon or how close you can be to twilight and stuff. So it definitely would be something for astronomers to think about. Of course, Betelgeuse itself is already still quite bright um, in the sky. All right. Uh, our last question, I think, for the night. Um, this goes back to what you said about the redshift of galaxies, but you said how we could tell the age of the galaxy because of like the redshift and how far it is and everything. But I'm wondering, what are the other methods to measuring the age of a galaxy that are closer to us? Like, how do we not know, or how do we know that a galaxy that's close to us isn't the same age as one that's that far? And just because of like the distance close to us, you know? Right. So that's a good question. So there, so there's the, it's basically there are two two different things, right? So there's the the redshift of a galaxy, which tells you how far away it is, and therefore how long the light has traveled, right? So if it's ten billion years, it's ten billion light years. So it, you basically look ten billion years into the past, right? And and then there's the maximal age. So and then you know at what time you know, what the age of the universe was. So 13.7 minus 10 billion is like uh, well, 3.7 uh, billion years, right? And that's the maximum age because you can't form a galaxy before the universe, right? And then there is the, the actual age of the galaxy, right? So how long it has been forming stars or when it did it start forming stars, right? So galaxies, um, so how they actually form is, is basically you, you have a, a structure of, dark matter in the universe, right? And um, and and that builds 
areas where you have more dark matter. Um, and dark matter is basically it has no interaction except through gravity, right? So dark matter, it can flow through you, you wouldn't notice, right? It's, but if you have a lot of dark matter, you, you have a gravitational attraction, right? And so that's what happens in the, in the early universe, right? So you have this, uh, this web of, it looks like a spider web, right? Um, of dark matter that forms. Um, and, and then you have gas in the universe. And so this over densities of dark matter, they attract the gas and it flows into those dark matter over densities and then stars are being formed um, as we heard before by basically construct contraction of the gas heating up and then you have uh, you basically have the ignition and you you have stars and then you build many stars and then you have a galaxy right so so when this this process form uh, starts that's basically the age what we call the age of a galaxy um, and it's not easy to measure it there's a there's a gigantic uncertainty on that right a factor of two to ten right um, but basically what we are doing is we observe the light of the galaxy um, and depending on what kind of stars you're forming or you have formed you either have more red light or more blue light right so if you have stars that have been formed in the past 100 million years you will have a lot of light in the uv right and so when you look at the spectrum or at the, the color of the galaxy it will be blue right um, and um, and then uh, if you have an older galaxy, you have more the old and massive stars that still remain, right? Because as we have heard, the more uh, uh, sorry, the, the less massive stars. Because the more massive stars, they, they die early, right? So what do you have ending up in the end after five, six, seven million billion years is the low mass stars, right? And so you change your kind of distribution of energy from the blue to the red, right? Um, and now it's funny. Um, so you have the redshift, right? Which tells you the distance to a galaxy. You have old galaxies that are also red. And in addition to that, you can have dust in your galaxy. That's also making a galaxy red, right? So great. <laughs> you can go home, right? <laughs> so this is basically the problem, right? And so the redshift, you can really just look at the emission lines, how they are shifted to the red, right? So that's, that's basically 100%, you get this. Um, and then the, what, how usually look at or measure how, how dusty a galaxy is, you do this also from the continuum, right? So if, if the galaxy is more red, um, uh, then you have, you know, more dust. But you can also use um, ratios of two emission lines. So for example, there's the hydrogen line H alpha at uh, uh, 650 nanometers. And then there is H beta at uh, 480 nanometers. And so the ratio of those, those two lines is fixed by quantum physics, right? It's a factor of 2.86. You can the write bright, this down. The brightness of those two lines. The brightness of the two lines, yes. Right, so, and, and H alpha is usually brighter by, two point, by a factor of 2.86, right? But if you have dust, you attenuate the bluer line because what dust basically does, it's like when you look at the sunset, it basically scatters the blue light and lets through the red light, right? So it's a reddening. And so your, your H alpha line might be brighter by a factor of three instead of 2.86, right? And from that, you can actually measure pretty precisely what is that dust content or the dust attenuation of the galaxy, right? So now you have redshift and dust, right? And now the only thing you have now to do is to fit the whole thing with a model. So you have different models of different ages, right? You fit it to, to each of the photometric points from the low uh, blue uh, wavelength um, to the red wavelengths um, and you basically have prior because you already know the dust and the redshift and that way you can figure out the age um, so hopefully i confused you totally but basically <laughs> what i want to say it's it's uh, it's there are degeneracies all over right so it's really hard to get the age of a galaxy um, yeah okay that brings us to the end of our our time. Thanks everybody for, for sticking around. Thanks for all the excellent questions. Also online, sorry we didn't get to all the questions you asked. I tried to answer a few in the last moments over the text, but um, thank you. So our next one of these will be at the end of March. We're switching to eight o'clock PM instead of seven o'clock. So Serena, remember that this time. Um, it's 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 simply because daylight savings is hitting and so the sun will be setting later and then we won't be able to 
I mean, assuming there aren't clouds blocking our view, uh, we'll have to, to go later in order to be able to have darkness. So we'll remain at the eight o'clock start time all the way through, I think, October. Um, but yeah, uh, join us for that in a month or Astronomy on Tap on March 13th, Monday, March 13th. And, and yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Have a great weekend and, and stay safe from this flash flood, torrential rain, snowstorm that's hitting Los Angeles. Thanks everybody.